If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump. Hey, hey guys. Ooh, what's going on? So for the first 40 minutes, we don't talk a whole lot about fitness, but we do have some fun conversation. Uh, we start out by talking about our favorite cereals. That's right. We all had favorite cereals. Sal dropped some mind-blowing knowledge here. Growing up. Uh, and I told everybody the surprising history of Kellogg's Corn Flakes. Find save it. out yeah, save why it. they Ooh. were invented. Yes. It's not what you think. Uh, then we talked about Adam's Sue V. Did I say it right? Yeah. Uh, meat bag uh, and how he's using <laughs> meat bag, it meat bag. to prepare his grass-fed and grass-finished uh, butcher box meat. Now check this out. Massive promotion through our sponsor Butcher Box. If you go to butcherbox.com forward slash mind pump, you're gonna get two free filet mignon steaks and some bacon mm. and twenty dollars off your first order. Really crazy. Uh, then we talked about the FaceTime bug on your phone. You might want to deactivate your FaceTime because people can spy on you. Anybody can. It's Yikes. crazy. Uh, Justin told us about the ice tsunami. Huh? That's a real thing. It's like a wrestling move. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> then we talked about the worst natural disasters, in our opinion, and our own brushes with death. I bring up genetically modified chickens. This is crazy. They are laying eggs that do magic things. Yeah. Um, and then again, we brought up uh, Justin's uh, sock-eaten dog. He just, just, he just won't learn. The exactly. alpha of the house. That's it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Then we get into the questions. The first question was, uh, what are the differences between barbell and and dumbbell exercises. So there are differences. What are they good for? What are they better for? Uh, which one do we prefer? Next question, what do we recommend as far as macros are concerned for muscle building? So macros represent proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. What's the best breakdown for muscle building? The next question, uh, when you can't complete a specific rep range in a program, should you lower the reps or lower the weight and perform the desired rep range. What's more important, the reps or the weight? And the final question, we make some predictions. We predict the next big fitness trend and or supplement nutrition trend uh, coming up soon. So we, we do our little Nostradamus thing that we've done mm, in the past. Whatever Shreds is doing next. We have yet to be mm. wrong. Uh, also, uh, this is the final hours. You've got like, let's see, if you get this episode right when it airs, I think you have like six or seven hours left for 50% off MAPS Anabolic, one of the biggest promotions of the year. If you go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and use the code RED50, R-E-D-5-0, no space, you'll get 50% off. We have other MAPS programs on there as well, by the way. So if you have specific goals, if you want to do correctional exercise, you want to train like a bodybuilder, you want to train like an athlete, for example, a bikini competitor, we have different programs for all different types of people and different types of goals. All of them can be found at mapsfitnessproducts.com. Wait a minute. You've been craving Fruity Pebbles? I just, right now, I, I think- Guess who else now is craving Fruity Pebbles, you asshole? <laughs> That's the, uh, Fruity Pebbles was my cereal of choice oh, when I was so, bulking. So good. Really? I could eat the whole box in, in a sitting. No, That's thanks. what I would do. Yeah, I That's literally, I used to get mad. They're like, there's not enough in this box. <laughs> <laughs> it only lasts me one breakfast. Because uh, they're little. You know what yeah. I'm saying? You can fill a whole cereal. It, it's only like three massive uh, bowls. You know no, what? I was, I was a Reese's Puffs and uh, Cinnamon Toast Crunch guy. Cinnamon Toast Crunch was diabetes instant. It was yeah. so sweet. And it, it turned your milk into like a sugary bomb. It only has like, you got- 10 minutes to eat it though. Oh no, I know exactly. <laughs> That's it's why like, it's so precious. It's so good. Yeah, as soon as it, the milk, it as soon as the milk hits it, it's great. But 10 minutes later it turns into a soggy mess. I, I remember the first time I made that mistake because you think more is better, right? And so I had this huge bowl of it and you just can't get to all the corners fast enough yeah. and so you end up eating half of it and you're like, Whoa. And it's then like it turns soggy into, just disgusting. It turns into one congealed mass of cinnamon yeah, sugar. It's like a gel. Yeah, I uh, I loved Fruity Pebbles. Uh, then, of course, Lucky Charms was the other one that was really good. Love that. Hi. And then uh, I thought that, uh, um, what's that one called? Um, grape Nuts. I thought Grape Nuts would be delicious when that, I was a kid. That's the old man in you. I, I saw the commercial and I'm like, oh, that looks so good. And I told my mom, I, I begged her. My mom's like, you're not going to like this. <laughs> And you know when you're a kid and your mom's right, but you don't want to tell her? Yeah, yeah so, you, so you eat, eat it begrudgingly. Yeah, I'm like, you, no, it's good. She's like, you're not going to like it. It's not what you think it is. I'm like, no. So she got it for me. 
That's the densest fucking cereal of all time. Yeah, dude. That's what I... Th- same thing, but with the shredded wheat, like the real shredded wheat. Fuck. It, it's like I was eating hay. Why would anybody, why would anybody eat that? Oh, I, I liked it. No I loved Frosted Mini Wheats. Frosted is well, different. Frosted is different. I'm yeah. talking about like the big old... like. Bricks. Yeah, who eats a brick for a, brick. a cereal? It's yeah. a it's a big block. Poor and you, kids. You, I was like, we used, to get, we used to get fed that. <laughs> that's <laughs> to that's, fill you up. That's back when cereal was <laughs> uh, if cereal for adults was all about pooping. Like for kids, it was all about sugar. Yeah, you're right. But for adults, it was all about this cereal With will extra help your fiber. Poop. Yeah, everything's about pooping. You remember that? <laughs> no, yeah. you're right. But the grape nuts, I remember my mom got it and I got a bowl and she's like, I don't know if you're gonna be able to eat that. And I'm like, oh. I always eat a full bowl of cereal. This is for kids. Do you know that I believe I believe this is why a lot of people, um, when they first go on a diet, like their stool is all fucked up because so many boxed, canned, packaged products have fiber infused in it, and so most people are eating a pretty fiber enriched diet. They develop like lazy colons. Yeah, no, I I, I think they get like <laughs> well, more than enough fiber in their diet, but then they switch over to like chicken breast, rice, and broccoli. And you start eating that, and even something that's fibrous like broccoli just doesn't compete with you know four four of your boxed meals you were eating that has do all this fiber infused. You, first yeah. of all, that the, your your lazy colon sound. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I was just picturing it in my head. <laughs> do you guys remember um, that? Do you remember Total Total yeah. cereal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And do you guys remember the commercial for Total? Barely. Uh, so Total was a it was like frosted. It, no, it wasn't frosted. It was like cornflakes. But the the selling point was that one bowl of total had so many vitamins in it that one bowl equaled like X amount of bowls of the competitor cereal. Oh, so they, I do remember that. So they would say, you know, yeah, because they're competing with Wheaties and uh, uh, was Special K. Yeah, so they'd be like, Rice Krispies are delicious, but you have to eat. 15 bowls of Rice Krispies yeah. <laughs> like, bub, 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 bub. to get yeah. all the vitamins that are in Total to, to yeah, the ceiling. Because Total was designed, it was literally a multivitamin cereal. <laughs> that was a selling <laughs> point. You know what I'm saying? So, Meanwhile, you just piss it all out. And, and it's, just, it's shit. Like, it's just garbage. But anyway, Saturday Night Live did a parody on that back in the, I want to say 70s or early 80s. I watched it on Laserdisc. Don't ask me. Oh, don't ask me why. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I don't know. That's a weird story. My parents, the house that we moved into when I was nine, the the old owners left us two things, a was laser this, disc player and a piano. Very strange. Was this colon blow? Colon blow, right yes. there. Yes. That's it, right there. I knew wow, it. you called that, Justin. Yes. Oh, I yep. knew it. I remember this. Yep, colon blow. And so you, they would eat it and be like, in order to equal the fiber <laughs> in one bowl of oat bran, you yeah. have to have this, or, you know, or the fiber in colon blow, you have to eat this many bowls, and it would be like a million bowls. <laughs> Yeah, see, they'd call it. Colon. Oh my god, I don't remember this. Colon blow, <laughs> colon blow, so and, so brilliant. And people would eat it, and then they would like their or ass yeah, would explode. Just, yeah, they would. Yeah, That's so great the all day. Dude, yeah. Justin, when was this commercial? What year was this? You think this has got to be eighties? That's what's his name. Eighty nine. Eighty nine. How oh, do shit. you remember that? Yeah. I have no idea. It's yeah. it's. You it's are full of burned. worthless information. It's burned in my head. Justin and me are very similar actually. I shouldn't say worthless. Ways. It is played. It's been extremely valuable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I know. <laughs> I got to start like rethinking that because yeah. like it's obviously played a crucial role in the development of the show. Yeah, yeah. because Sal would say that, and I would say I have I can't remember it at all. But yeah. you right away. There was, a, there was a purpose to it all. <laughs> See, and then the cereal the cereal bowls would just explode, and to show you that it's like yeah. a thousand. <laughs> A thousand <laughs> bowls. This is a huge pyramid. Yeah. Just yeah, he's sitting on the top. dude. The oh, cereal man. market is actually so quite funny. It's it's very it's it's hilarious. We're, we do you guys know what the history of of cereal is? What Some do you mean? Cereals? What do you mean? Oh, they're just uh, trying to get rid of uh, a grain. No, um, which one is it? Is it cornflakes? I want to say it was cornflakes. Do you guys know what the history of cornflakes was? No, tell me. A doctor created a cereal that would prevent people from masturbating. Okay, now this. Now is you're full not, of shit. I didn't know this. Are you? You guys want to challenge me on this? You are full of shit. Right? Stop right. masturbating. Yes. A doctor creates a cereal yes. to help to explain doctor, because the cereal was so bland. I swear on my life, this is what he would say: that things that are overly tasty and stimulate the senses encourage increase like the, the fact that you want to have sex and stuff. So what you need to do is do everything bland, and it will prevent people wow. from masturbating because they thought masturbating was bad for you, and so. Was he like a Quaker? Doug, are like you looking those, this like up? Mormons? Would you look at that? It's so oh, weird how I'm right. Oh my God. He, beli- he believed, this is Dr. Kellogg. So Kellogg's, he was a doctor, Dr. John Harvey Kellogg. He believed that a diet centered on bland foods like cereal would lead Americans away from sin. One very specific <laughs> sin, 
masturbation. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah shut they, the fuck up. They, dude. they thought they were going to cure hysteria with women with vibrators. That's true. Too. <laughs> I I posted Which, about that a couple uh, years ago. Uh, I do remember yeah. that. Yeah. Those doctors, a great idea, were very successful. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> if, if it was just based on the amount of office visits they got. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to walk out uh, feeling great. Right, and think of the, the the husbands were probably encouraging it. Like my wife's been awesome. I don't know. Ever since she's been seeing Doctor <laughs> yeah. Doctor right. Fingers. I don't know. Touch man. and feel. Yeah. She she comes back happy as fuck. You know, we don't get any more. Wow. I have never heard this before. How yeah, is no, Kellogg's as massive as it is? And I've never heard the story. Where the fuck did you yeah. read this story? Um, I don't remember where I heard it, but it's obviously you'll never forget it once you read it because it's so stupid yeah. and insane. But yeah, it's true. But that's the history of. A lot of a lot Kellogg's of these cereals, frosted flakes, and, and for then, when you wink, and then, <laughs> and by the way, it doesn't work. It doesn't no. stop masturbation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it's, it I've, doesn't. I've tested this. What theory. do they call it? N one. <laughs> the N one yeah. result. Yeah. I've tested yeah. this theory. No, but he. Um, but it's funny because before this, s- breakfast in, was cooking. You had to cook breakfast, and cereal really came onto the scene, and it became mm. breakfast. It became this is what you have in the morning. And now it's like cuts a out prep time, which apparently while they're prepping, you know, breakfast, it was wank time. Mm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm not trying to like correlate this. Yeah, but but uh, no, it's funny because corn obviously was is an American staple crop, and so th- all kinds of shit was made with corn during this this whole period of time because it was so inexpensive, it was <clears throat> grown everywhere, mm. and you know he came up with corn flakes, and wow. it's funny because people will buy it now and be like, oh, it's so good. But they literally sold it on the fact that it was bland. Yeah. So, so bland that you won't even want to touch yourself. Yeah. yeah. You know that, what I'm saying? Yeah, that's, that's pretty fascinating. Speaking that's of food, bland. how is your uh, your your plat your meat bag stuff going? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are eating meat out of a bag. No, days, huh? dude, I told you I got a silicone bag for it, man. It's sous vide, right? Yeah. We actually just um Katrina just kicked up our um our butcher box. So what I, one of the things I love about Butcher Box is they give you the option of uh, every month, every other month, or like every every third month that you can actually uh, subscribe to their their being delivered to you. Because originally when we did it, it was like oh mm-hmm. we were we were getting so much meat that I was like oh I feel like it's just starting to pile up in the freezer because we're not getting to all of it. Yeah. And so then I put it. I think I put it to a every other, and then eventually I think I even went to three. And now I'm going back to the other direction because of how convenient this has become. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's so nice. So you said it's with an app. <clears throat> yeah, it's all controlled through all and through. It's the- cheap too. The whole thing costs. Yeah, it was under hundred bucks. Under hundred bucks for it. It's super. It's super easy. I mean, Katrina literally. She she puts the the meat in the bag. Right. She'll you know, and she does. She'll text me like, hey, this is what we're. We're having tonight. So you go meat, the meat in the bag, water in the pot, and you have, and it's a sous vide thing that's set up. Yeah, so it's just a, it's a thermometer that heats up the, the, the water. The, sous, the thermometer heats up the water. Yeah, well, the the sous vide thing. Oh, okay, it's okay. got a thermometer okay, on. It. You know it, what I mean? It. It's okay. all built in, right? Okay, it's all okay. built in, and it, and it heats it up. So you don't have to turn the stove on. Or but one like of the, that. one of the things, no, you don't have to do nothing like that at all. It's all yeah, exactly. There's no stove, no gas, no nothing. It's you put water, and then the the actual you know sous vide thing is what is what heats it up. Oh. What I like about it is this: is you know if there's ever a knock on butcher box from somebody, somebody who's unfamiliar with eating grass fed beef sometimes can be thrown off. Like if you're if you went and had some crazy juicy steak at your favorite restaurant and then you hear Mind Pump talking about how great uh butcher box is, you order it and then you you bite into it and you're like, it just doesn't taste right. as flavorful it's not as, as yeah, fatty and uh, juicy and whatever. Right. So you know the 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 knock that people have and that's just because this grass fed. It's grass fed. So what I always, you know, encourage people to do is Try any grass-fed meat anywhere, and then try Butcher Box, and I promise you that you'll be blown away. And then now with the sous vide, oh man, because I can cook it perfect. Because that's the one thing too about like grass-fed meat that's lean. It cooks mm-hmm. faster, doesn't it? it? Well, not only does it cook faster, but it's also it, it's if you're always if you're used to cooking with regular meat all the time, and that, that there's more. Uh, and Doug, because Doug's more of a cook than I am, he could probably speak to this. <laughs> There's there's less room for air yeah. with like leaner cuts. Like mm-hmm. if you have a really lean cut and it's and you it's you got to be like on top of yeah, every, you, every bit of it. Yeah, you got to be precise. You or else it could get dry and it does you don't have a lot of fat to save it, right? And save the flavor. With the sous vide, that, that's what's been great. So, man, I, we've kicked up our butcher box because 
you know, and I, and I openly admit that I still like to go have a cancer steak somewhere else every once in a while because it is the, the fattiness of it's amazing. And so, you know, I would bounce back and forth. But now with that, dude, that's all I've been you know, eating. Back you in know, back in the day, it was back in the day, it was more dif- more expensive to eat grain fed uh, meat. <clears throat> so if you went to the grocery store, they would advertise grain fed because it was the flavor. Well, it's just it's fattier. It's fattier. The fatty acid profile. It's not as healthy for you. So if you mm-hmm. eat, look, if you hunt an animal, if have you guys ever eaten wild game? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. It, it tastes. That's what the term gamey. It tastes, yeah, it tastes tough. wild yeah. because yeah. they eat. Uh, these are not you know fat cows just sitting there eating food that they've they, they weren't that didn't evolve eating or whatever. So grass-fed meat's going to have a little bit of a different flavor, but you're right. It's got the best. But you know what I've, it too, what I've been doing, because I, I was in the similar boat with that in terms of like having an excess of meat all the time where I kind of went forward and back with in terms of like having three months out. Now I'm back to like every other month uh, we'll get like a, a shipment. Um, and because I barbecue a lot and, and the weather hasn't always permitted me to like barbecue a lot of it. So we started using the iron skillet. That's how I do it. And then put it yes. in the oven. And uh, there's so many recipes and there's like, mm-hmm. you know, ways that will marinate it ahead of time. And then it just, it, it comes out really, really good. Like, in a, in, and it's cooked throughout. So it's like a pretty consistent uh, cook. Yeah. So Max Lugavere asked him about cooking in an iron skillet. And he said, it's a great idea uh, for people who also want to increase their iron intake. Hmm. Do you, you know that you get iron? From cooking in an iron skillet? I didn't realize that. Just from the contact? Yes. Uh, so especially for women who are menstruating, that might be a good idea. Hmm. Um, and now, uh, can you overdo it? Uh, theoretically, you could. You could just eat too much iron um, from an iron skillet. But um, otherwise, it's probably a decent you know, a, a decent thing. Well, that, we that's we sear it in that. So what I so do- So first you sear it, and then, or no, is no, that after you afterwards. sear it? Afterwards. So after the, the sous vide is great because it, you set it at a temperature, whatever you want your meat cooked at, right? So if however you like it, rare or medium or medium well, whatever, you, you figure that out. Once you figure that out in the app, you just like, oh, it's a three inch steak. I mm-hmm. want it medium. This is the cut. And then you, you put it in and then you can't overcook it. It can boil for four hours longer than what it needs, and it will never overcook. It'll cook right to that temperature. So there's no like urgency of like, oh, I got to pull it off the grill. Or, so is it cooking the whole time? Whole time. Hmm. Whoa. Whole time. It's constantly cooking. And you could say, and if you want to cook it longer and slower, you can. You could, there's a lot of different options. And then, then as soon as, so she'll set it on. Like right now, there's one on the stove literally today. And she'll probably, what time is it right now? It's one. She'll probably kick it on in about an hour. Through so, her phone. Through her phone. She'll kick it on on her phone, and then I'll get home around four or five, and then she'll roll in right after me, and then I'll I'll, I'll already have the iron skillet ready. I'll throw some butter on it and get it real real hot, and then I'll just I'll sear it on each side for about a minute, two minutes, and then pull it right off. Wow. And then for her, because she likes her meat more well done than I do. I just leave hers on the skillet longer than I leave mine. She likes to char, like yeah. charcoal. Ruined. Yeah. That's, That's what a, she's- Yeah. When we order it, how, she, I always bust her chops about that. When we order, when especially when we're going to like a really nice steakhouse, I always, and it gets to her turn to order, right? And that's, you just ruin hers, please. That's mm. what how she likes just it. Just ruin it. Yeah. So, so <laughs> d- d- change the subject. Did you guys hear about the FaceTime bug on uh, the iPhone? Did you hear about this? Uh, yeah, you scared me with that, and I immediately turned mine off. Did I send it to you guys? Yeah. I did. Did you see it, Adam? I, you sent it, but I didn't read it. So there's a bug that someone discovered on FaceTime, and they posted it on their Twitter, and it went viral because it's true. It's a real thing. And um, Apple is now addressing it. And so later this week, they're saying that they're going to fix it and, and update everybody's phone. But basically, the way it works is if you FaceTime someone – before they answer the phone, you add a call, add yourself. They don't pick up the phone or anything. You so, automatically hear oh, everything that they're saying. Wow. Okay. So this is only, I don't even have to read the article. So this is only for your the new ones, the 10s and above, because you, okay, we have this option. This just happened to my sister and I. So we have this option, if, if you have the 10 and above, right, that we can actually FaceTime all four of us. Right, right, right. All on one screen. You right. can't do that if you have an old. If you have, if one person has an old phone in it, you can't do it. So I was trying to do it with me, Katrina, and my sister. My sister has an older phone. So what ended up happening was after we did it, and we hung up. She was lo- she was locked into us. She could hear us the whole time. I oh, hung up wow. everything, got the phone off, and my sister was like, "I can't get out." 
She's like, I can hear everything and I'm still connected to you. And we played her. It took us like 10 minutes to get disconnected. Once I had connected to her, it, it stayed connected and she was hearing our conversation. Damn. And the Hopefully whole, you guys weren't Kane saying some crazy shit. That we weren't, <laughs> thank God, because we were trying to figure this all out. I was trying to find this because I hadn't done it yet. I hadn't gone on. I knew that it's the new phone is capable of this, but I haven't done it yet yeah. where I've had three or more people talking on the FaceTime at one time. And what I had found out was that you can't do it with a phone that's that's not a 10 or above. And my sister, I think, has like a 6 or a 7. And so if it, Katrina has a 10. So boom, Katrina pops up. I pop up. We're trying to add my sister. My sister can log in, but then she can't see anything. And so we're like, oh, fuck. So we like hang it up. But she still hears everything. She still hears everything. She yep. heard everything going on. Yep. Wow. How fucked up is that if you're uh, talking about I didn't even somebody? Put, I didn't even put uh, that together. You imagine you're like on a, on a four-way FaceTime call, and then they, you know, they hang, hang up, up, and then you and your buddy are like, God, what a fucking asshole that yeah. guy, you know? What a dick. You know that's what happened. I'm sure that's how it, why it went viral because someone probably th- did exactly that. Talk shit after. Otherwise, you'd be like, how'd you know? Same thing that probably happened to me, which is no big deal. It was like, oh, wow, that's weird. That's a glitch. It just highlights that it is completely possible for people from a remote in a remote way to be able to access your microphone mm-hmm. and or your camera. That's just a, 100% highlights that that's totally a real thing. There's another way to use that bug to access someone's camera, they said. So you could do it, access their camera, not hear what they're saying. But see everything. Well, I believe phone. it. After yeah. after seeing that happen, it's like, oh wow, I could see how you could easily get into that, dude. Yeah. Hey, it's- what are you doing? Right? I'm on the bathroom. Wait, I'm gonna Facetime you. No, no, never mind. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's creepy, dude. I, I guys tell you, I've been watching this this series that's just like all about these crazy wild events, like in nature, and like uh, it was some. I don't know if it was I fucking love science or it's one of these like uh, documentaries where they just show like the crazy stuff I never even knew were possible. One of them was like uh, these ice tsunamis and ice. You, you think ice? You know what do you mean ice? Ice is, doesn't move, you know, except for like glaciers and whatever. But uh, on the video, they they start breaking it down. You see like just this this cluster of ice consuming this house and it's like going through the house it's busting over and then moving like towards like the rest of the neighborhood and just consuming this entire Look at that. town it's right there yeah so it's almost like a mudslide but with ice right so what was happening they had like record breaking winds and they're right next to this lake and so it, like all the excess like loose ice that was on the top layer started getting moved by the wind and then it just started sliding and mounting and just started coming into people's houses and busting through the windows and it was did just you, it was did, crazy. Did you ever see the image? Um, and I believe this happened like, I want to say it was like four years ago or so. And it was, I, I believe it was off of uh, Lake Michigan. They had a crazy, it was like, you know, 10 below or something, and they had a crazy windy storm, and the waters from the lake came up and, and went over the cars and froze like that. Froze like in a, in a wave. Yes. I did see a picture. Yes. Yeah. It was crazy. That's ter- That's terrifying. Did you imagine yeah, horror being yeah, dude, in your horrific. house and seeing a mountain of ice move Just towards whoosh. you yeah, slowly? Yeah, there's it. video of it, and it's it's such a trip to watch. Like, you were watching this on a documentary. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah it's not, How do you stop it? You could like, you, what do you throw fire at, it and then you got a, a water coming at you. You, <laughs> you know can't stop it, dude. You're fucked either way, <laughs> it just shows you. You know, that's there's just like things that happen that you're just like. Oh, what fuck. do you guys think would be the scariest like natural disaster situation? Like, oh, are you afraid of like burning, drowning? I know like, what mine is being stuck. Like, what's what I know is, what mine is hundred percent. What is yours? <sighs> Tsunami. Really, hundred percent. That is terrible. I don't know what it is about it. When I was a kid, it terrified me to think about. But just imagine you're on a beach or near the near the ocean, and then just a massive wall of water. Like, what? The, what do you do? That'd yeah. be the most for me. That'd be the most terrifying thing. I'd rather be caught in a firestorm than something like that. Yes, that's that's a tough. Like I I remember as a kid, we used to do a lot of hiking, and I was up in Mount Lassen, and we were like walking, and, and I was looking at. Uh, you know, some of the, what do you call those? Like where it's, um, geysers and like things like that, where it's like, yeah, it's still active and mm. you can see like things happening. And I was like, saying, I was like, wow, everything is still really hot. Like what's to say, like, it just doesn't blow up all of a sudden. And then we're going to get consumed by this volcano. And then it like terrified the shit out of me. I, I there would, was somebody that did that. Somebody fell. I don't remember what park it was, what national park, but somebody fell into <laughs> one of those hot springs. Yeah. And they couldn't save them, and you can't go in and get them. 
It was and like so Yellowstone, I think. It, it liquefied his body. Oh, my God. <laughs> did it really? <laughs> yes. did That's what? so horrible. Yeah, it, they had to leave him in there, and it just fucking liquefied him. What? Yeah. How fucked up. Bro. That's horrific. It's dude. terrible you're laughing, too. Someone's like, fuck, that was my uncle. Yeah. Yeah. So you're yeah. listening I'm right sorry now. about that. Yeah, but right. Yellowstone yeah. is a, is a ma- it's called a massive super volcano. Super volcano. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's not uh, not active. It's still active. It's the largest That could kill US, everybody. They, they say at some point it will erupt at some point. And if it does, it'll take out half of North America. Yeah. Like that's how big. You know, the Mayans thought we were going to die like four years ago. Or whatever. <clears throat> that's how big of an. I would be afraid of like an, an avalanche, man. Like getting like trapped in snow uh, yeah. and like suffocating. suffocating oh. You know, I, my my brother in law uh, Tom is like getting into this uh, backcountry uh, cross country snowboard ski thing. I don't know if you guys have seen these yet. It's a it's a it's a new popular thing where. It looks like a snowboard, but it, it, it unhooks and then turns into uh, like snowshoes. Oh, and then it connects together and turns in. And so you go backcountry and you kind of hike to like these cool remote places and then mm-hmm. you can connect it and then snowboard down. Hmm. And he's getting into it with a bunch of these guys. And he goes there and everyone's really hardcore and they go to some pretty, you know, rural areas that, you know, nobody's walked back there. And so there's this the big fear of, you know, you getting caught in an avalanche, and it's really common that these guys, you know, X amount of them every year die from getting trapped in that. And so he's been doing all this training, and he's got this bag. I thought this was crazy. I didn't know this existed. And it's uh, is this the one that you pull the string and yes, it inflates? Yes. Yeah, and you surf uh, the freaking avalanche or well, whatever. Well, so what it will do? Just create space. No, well, yeah, what it'll do is create space so you could breathe for a little bit longer. Oh. You still, you know, you still only have so long to live before wow. someone's got to find you. So exactly, it's like it, all of a sudden, if you an avalanche is coming on you, you pull this, it shoots up like a like a parachute or fills up like a balloon above you. And then if the avalanche covers over you, you've got this, you know, five by five diameter, you know, airspace yeah. that now gives the people that were with you hopefully enough time to get and down. And you probably have like a, a device like a like that shows them where you're at. So GPS you can find tracker. You. Yeah, something like yeah that. I think all of them have that on. I think they, that's part of it. I read an article once. I don't know how true this is, but I, apparently one of the worst things about being caught in an avalanche is when you try to dig yourself out, you don't know what direction you're digging. Right, up oh, or down. So you're man. like, you could dig deeper. You could yeah. be going sideways. You could have tumbled like, and so you have no direction. Yeah, yeah, and so what I read was the guy said, and I don't know how true this is, okay, so look this up for yourself, but he said one of the ways you can know what direction you're facing is to spit and the where the spit falls tells you obviously if it falls down your face you know opposite direction to go in that direction. oh that's interesting that's what i read in your you article. know i remember and i think huh. i've talked about it on the show i don't remember i know i think i've told you guys before maybe i haven't but one of the scariest moments of my life was getting trapped on a on a mountain when we were snowboarding and uh, i'd never even I, i've ridden this resort a, a hundred times plus and I'd never heard these sirens and alarms go off before. And I was coming up the lift already to get ready to go ride down again. And it was the windiest day that I'd ever been up there before. And the chairlifts are kind of swinging back and forth. And, you know, I've been up, I've been around, uh, you know, weather like that on that mountain. And so I was, I wasn't really tripping out yet until I get off the lift and then the sirens start going off and then they're, they're announcing to evacuate the mountain, everybody go down. And then he, we're getting hit by this, this blizzard out of nowhere. And it was the fucking scariest feeling I ever had for what, to the point, um, and you reminded me when you said that, Salas, because I couldn't tell where I was at. The, the wind was blowing so hard. The snow was coming down so fast. It was, it was piling up in front of me so quick. It was moving left to right so fast that I couldn't see the trail. I couldn't see my hand in, in front of my face. And so, you know, you would think, oh, you're at the top of the mountain. So you just slowly come straight down on the trail. Well, I couldn't tell if I was going off trail where potentially there is a cliff yeah. or if I was staying on the trail that takes you down the mountain safely. And so that was fucking What'd you shit. do? Just stay still? So, so you know, when you snowboard, like, you know, skiing, you do like the pizza, like snowboard, you you plow down like this on your heels. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I'm plowing down. I mean, I'm inching and I'm screaming my the, my friend's names that are with me because I can't see them, even though they're probably just five, 10 feet away from me. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm riding with my hands in front of me in case I hit a tree or come up on a cliff or something like that I need to grab. And so I'm like... And it took me to go down a, a, a little hill, you know, it's not a hill, but the top of the mountain down, you know, I, I ride that in one song. So normally I put a song on, I listen to it. So it takes me three to four minutes to get down this mountain. I think it took me like an hour, hour and a half 
the whole time just going like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I would, I would, I'd go really, really just slow. Inching. Yeah, then I would sit down out of fear, like trying to you know, wipe off my. So, so what do you tell yourself yeah. in those moments when you're scared like that? You know, I think when I think when you're in something like that, like I, I try and go back to like what was going through my head, and it's it's survival mode. Like yeah. I'm not thinking about anything else. My life didn't flash before my eyes. I'm not thinking like, oh, all the shit I did wrong or some crazy. Like, or yeah, I am. I'm sure, I'm, literally right it. I'm out. sure I'm praying. I'm yeah. sure I'm going like, God, please let me just just help me get to the bottom of this or whatever like that. Please, please, you know. And you know, I had people that were with me, but it was so scary that. They they would could be right as close as you are to me, and yeah. I can't see them. So we're like yelling back and forth, "Hey, hey!" You know, so we could hear each other. Yeah. Oh man, that was a definitely up there with the scariest moments of my life. You know, it was one of my scariest Gnarly. moments. Was actually with you guys. For me, what? Where? Remember when we were on the plane coming from uh, what was it, Seattle? Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. That Storm, was fucking Storm. gnarly. You can't tell me that was no. That gnarly. was probably some no. Of the, it was that was some of the worst turbulence we've ever been. Yeah, I've ever, was... I've, I've never experienced turbulence like that. There were people crying next to me. You almost felt like you were gonna just jump out of your seat, like with some of those dips. Oh, dude, it was crazy. Yeah, was, that that to me was terrifying. I was literally sitting there. I had the <laughs> Brain FM meditation music on going out of my headphones. So I agree with yeah. you. It, 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 that probably would be up there for me, except for I was lucky enough to train a uh, a flight attendant for a really long time. And we talked about many, many things. And one of the things that she used to always tell me is that turbulence is not scary at all. Mm. And that as scary as it feels, it's the least risky and dangerous part of the entire flight. Mm. The landing and the takeoff is the most dangerous yeah. parts. And she goes, you know, pilots, the when the way you feel turbulence, they think of it like going over speed bumps, going five miles an hour. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you were to be driving your car through a parking lot and go over a speed bump, think of you being all free. Sure. So that was going through, when we were going through that, like I'm telling myself that, even yeah. though I'm with you, I feel like, oh, No, fuck. I was freaking out, but yeah, but I... I before that when I was in college and I was driving back uh on major freeway through Illinois uh it was like a five lane freeway and we hit black ice and we were all, I was all the way on one side of the freeway and just started sliding uncontrollably and like I'm pretty good about like staying calm in terms of like not like overcorrecting I wasn't overcorrecting I wasn't like speeding up like slamming on the brakes anything like that but I literally had no traction at all. I couldn't fucking do anything about it. And it was like terrifying because I kept sliding. There was nobody on the road. This was really late at night. I was slowly sliding across all five lanes, like just inching my way across. <laughs> and then I see behind me lights, you know, and it was like truck lights, oh, you know, like big rig lights. That sucks. And I was like, oh, fuck. And then I finally hit the embankment. And it, it turned the car kind of around. And so I was facing now the lights and they were getting closer and closer. And, uh, it, and it was like in, in my lane. And so I was like, oh, fuck, I got to do something and turn the car back on because it killed the engine and turn it back on and then punched it. And then we, we shot across to the other side and I made it across the other side while it was like, Meow. oh, oh wow. <laughs> and, and that was like the scariest shit ever. We almost lost yeah, Justin. You almost did. <laughs> that's just close. That's scary. Well, talking about uh, more crazy things, this just got posted in our forum literally um, right before we started recording. So I'm going to read to you what I think to be the craziest thing that I've read in a long time, What? but it's a real, um, it's a real article. So there are, they, they, have figured out how to genetically modify chickens. Let me see if I can find the article here. Oh, God. That lay eggs with anti-cancer drugs. What? what? So, what? so what they- Say what? Yes. So they have genetically modified chickens that can lay eggs that contain drugs for arthritis and some cancer. <laughs> what? Like, why, why don't we just take the drugs? Be, well, because it's 100 times cheaper to produce when, when they're laid. By by a by chickens rather than being manufactured in factories. Wow! Like if you can make a bunch, if you can make these chickens produce these proteins, I'm so what confused they basically right are, now. What they are, they're these 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 proteins that you find that are used in these types of immune therapies for cancer and for some forms of arthritis. And what they've done is they've modified these chickens to produce these proteins in their eggs. So now these eggs, they take them out, boom, they they extract the protein out of the uh, out of the egg that they need for these drugs. And there you go. You know what this a, is? Spider goat all yeah, over again. Exactly. Fucking, they're, they're getting crazy now. Yeah, but I mean, how crazy is that? That is crazy. How insane is that? That they can they can produce these... Now, here's the thing. <laughs> I, I just, I'm a science fiction 
yeah, you know, uh, yeah, fan I subscribe or whatever. Too. Yeah. yeah, I'm just imagining some. What if they get like they lose one of the eggs and then it, it like hatches into like some crazy chicken? <laughs> <laughs> it's important we harvest these. Don't let them get fertilized. <laughs> yeah. exactly. I might have a few of those. Like an angry big exactly. bird, fucking yeah. crazy dude, chickens. D- dude, going back on the weather. Did you guys see what the what the weather's going to be happening in? The, I think it's the Midwest, or, or is that what's happening, Doug, in the Midwest right now? You brought it up. What is it? I don't like get it. the coldest, coldest weather that's happened in a very long time right now. <laughs> Is about to hit places. Poor really? Ba- poor yes. bastards. I thought we. I thought global warming is happening. You know the, yeah. the people who talk about <laughs> oh, it's called let's, it's let's, called let's climate change this. now. Oh, oh, okay. Let's, oh, let's do yeah. this. They yeah. changed it. Yeah, we we're we're on a roll with the fucking yeah <laughs> the third rail. Uh, no, but uh, it's called climate change, Adam. And um, this is a softball pitch. Uh, the, yeah. What they say is that the that there's more extreme weather events, but apparently this is like the coldest weather that some of these areas have seen in I believe a century. If I'm not mistaken, that's wow. crazy. Yeah, can you pull, Doug? Are you able is to pull it like, up some of the weather? Is it abnormally, or is it just going to hit records? Like, if, for example, like if the coldest it's ever been well, here, it's February, is, it's going to be Jan- February, is January, like minus thirty. Cold? It's going to be minus thirty-five. Right, because when I was there, the first year I was there, it was minus thirty wind chill. You know, with the wind chill, I can only imagine how much colder you can get from that, dude. That's like Antarctica. So it's historic cold. It's the polar vortex. It's another polar vortex. I want to see what some of these what some of these temperatures are reaching. Because here we are in California, and you know it was fucking freezing the other day. I think it hit like fifty degrees. <laughs> it makes you feel like a massive. Holy pussy. shit! The Dakotas and northern Minnesota, the wind chill temperatures hit minus fifty. Oh, oh my god! Oh, dude, you That's just so you can't even like you can't even wear anything to deal with that. Wow, as far south as Illinois, minus thirty and minus forty when you include the wind chill. That's insane. The upper Midwest, it says it's going down as low as negative 65. Dude. Wow. I'm like, time for a vacation, right, I, if I, I'm living there? I wow. got some shit the other, yesterday, it was yesterday day before I posted my uh, my favorite winter rotation of shoes, yeah. and if, I got all the Midwest people DMing me like, fuck you. Listen, <laughs> you're, all, your, all your winter shoes are uh, low tops. Right? <laughs> <laughs> They're not like ice And boots. you know what's funny is like what, what made me post that, because uh, last time I posted like my summer ones, and I, I got a bunch of people that liked it and were talking to me about it, so I posted the, the winter ones. And what deci- what dictates a winter shoe for me is like the, the gum sole is, is a darker color and it's darker material, and so I'll, if it's w- rainy and dirty, then my shoes don't get as dirty because they're dark. Like it has nothing to do with me having to tromp through fucking snow or anything. Yeah, so you're not gonna factor in that. In. Right, I didn't think about that yeah. when I posted. I'm just like, this is really what I do in the winter time because yeah. we don't have. I don't have. I don't own a pair of fucking snow boots or like. No, why would you need? Yeah, them? hardy no. boots for us no. at all. D- Justin, when you lived in Chicago, what was the coldest weather that? Dude, you I was massively underprepared. Like massively underprepared. Like I, like I told you, it was 30 below Like the with the wind chill as you walk so outside. So you've been in 30 below? Yeah, like, bri- like briefly. I'm sure it wasn't as bad as like it is you know, on this record breaking, but mm. it, it, to me, it was like literally shell shock. I, I thought that I could wear three to four sweatshirts and that was going to be okay, you know? <laughs> And it just it? blew it blew right through you. It blew through you. And like and you felt like it was just penetrating through your skin and you were just like you would shake so hard that like I couldn't stop shaking inside even though it was warm. It was Are, just uncontrollable. Do people actually go outside when it's like that? Yeah. Yeah. They, you get used to it. I mean you acclimate to it. Like so I, what do you wear? What are you supposed to wear? You wear down jackets and like gloves and like you like are prepared and shit. It like, you have like scarves. Like they wear all that stuff. And what about when you breathe in the air? Don't you feel your insides freeze and shit? Well, yeah. If it's like thirty, if like it's real windy like that, yeah, mm-hmm. they'll, they'll do like See, facial. I love stuff. cold weather. I love cold. But weather. You, you say that, the- but you haven't been to that. No, you're right. I think the most I've been in is like minus thirteen. Like I don't yeah. think I've been much colder than that. And you know, but. The, there are different colds too, dude. It's not the same cold. Well, that's a wind chill. I think that's probably worse, right? Yeah. Isn't it worse? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I've been at literally minus 13, so I don't even remember what the wind the wind chill okay. factor was on top of that. So it was probably pretty fucking cold. But, dude, it, it, and, and I know somebody who's Midwest right now is going to like scoff at what I'm about to say, but, you know, San Francisco, <laughs> it, when <laughs> no, it's- No, you're not. Yeah, no, San Francisco, when it's windy, is some yeah, of the- it's free. I it lived, is. I grew up, I, I lived, I lived for two cold. years in Colorado and it's, it's seen crazy storms and been in minus 13 there, and I've been colder in San Francisco. Mm. Especially if so it's, it's raining so and wet, and then you get that wind right. chill. So my, my point, I'm not saying yeah. that San Francisco is up there with the coldest places to live in California or in the United States. What I'm, my point is that 
minus whatever isn't always a great indicator of what fucking bone chilling cold feels yeah. like. Well, it's because the, the it's wet uh, wet air. It's yes. wet cold air. Right, and back there there's a lot of dry air, and it's and it just feels it feels mm. different. I I remember going down to the bus stop as a kid at minus three degrees in a t-shirt because it was it was nice outside. It wasn't windy as fuck. It wasn't raining or anything like that. It was it was cold and dry, and so it didn't it didn't feel the same. I've been in San Francisco before. Where I am freezing my balls off, and it's thirty something degrees or forty degrees. It's not crazy, you know, but that the wind, the wind chill factor coming off the water. I mean, those are some, those are some of the coldest times. Dude. Yeah, I feel like I was tougher back then. You know what I mean? You don't think you can handle it yeah. today? Today I'm just, I'm soft. Mm. Yeah, coming, coming back here to California, it's like, ah. well, I remember when I lived in Palm Springs for a little while. I lived through the summer there, and it, it would, it would hit, you know, it'd be ninety degrees at eight o'clock in the morning, and it would hit one hundred and twenty. Uh, you know, by three, four p.m. and 120 is re- it's really fucking hot. And then I come back up to San Jose and it'd be 89, 90, and everybody'd be like, "Oh my god, it's so hot!" And I'd be like, "It's not that hot." I think you just get used to wherever you're at. You know? Yeah, that's how. I mean, I came back to watch like a high school football game. I remember, and I was like out in Chicago for the first couple of years, and it was one of those nights where you get like it's a little windy it's cold for everybody here and like they're all bundled up everything and i was like wearing a t-shirt and just like this is nothing like eat a bunch of pussies and like i realized like that's just you just i acclimated yeah there's those uh there's these tribes that live up in the God, what is it the himalayas where that's what they they live in this frigid temperature and you always i always see pictures of them online they i i have uh, i had Doug bring it up once where the guy's hunting with the falcon on the Oh, on yeah, the horse. Yeah. I remember yeah. that. But you see pictures of these little kids and they're all bundled up with their little red, cute little cheeks and shit. And this is just what they live in yeah. all the time. And, you know, your body, I guess it gets it gets used to it. So Doug, I, I've been wanting to ask you, uh, Justin, about your how your alpha dog is doing. <laughs> is there any stories with that guy? He, uh, Dude, okay, so I told you about the whole sock sort of fixation. Well, that has, you know, persisted. He literally can't stop himself from eating socks. Jesus, I don't know bro. what to do. Pick up your fucking socks. That's no, a start. No, that's not it. <laughs> he will dive his face into the laundry. Oh, really? And even though we pack it way at the bottom, like he'll go all the way in there and just like consume, especially Courtney's and then my son's. And for some reason, he just loves their socks. So, and we figured it out. Like when both of us aren't in the same room as him, this is like a a weird devious thing he does. Like she went in to to take a shower and I was downstairs with, with the kids playing and uh, she got out of the shower and, and caught him with one of them in his mouth and he was chewing it. And then, uh, you know, where she's like, Oh no, he's eating the, the socks again. We're sitting there watching TV. Not even like ten minutes later, he throws up five socks. Five? Yeah. Holy! Shit. <laughs> throws it up, and it's like, dude, it's like I I can't even like wrap my brain around how stupid he is. Like it's <laughs> it, it's just it's just I can't even anymore. You know, like so, I never. So Bentley eats Katrina's dirty underwear. Like that's her, <laughs> well, I, well, I get that. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah, his yeah. thing. He's. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> So he's like he's, his owner. Yeah, <laughs> I think he learned this. That's from, a learned trait. Yeah, I think he learned this from me. So, so I've had I do to, not have a foot fetish. Yeah, I've had know. to. Uh, I've had to untrain him for uh, that. Sure, yeah. <laughs> he, he won't. He won't go into the the laundry basket though. Like she. So it's like we have to be careful if it was like a one of those you know wild nights of sex where you know oh, no. where wow. I just tear her clothes off and they go all over the floor and the boys are in the room like that's the first I've now trained. Are they, are they in the room when you guys have sex? Yeah, of course they're in the room. No, they're right? not. Of course they are. It happens, bro. Like, yeah. You just get used to it. We live all, I mean, we it's like all, having an audience. All of our door. Really? See, we don't have kids or anything. So all yeah, of I our. I don't want, my kids aren't in the room when I'm No, no, no. Uh, I said, I don't have kids. I don't have anything. So I don't, we don't close our master bedroom door. Mm. So our master bedroom door, stay, all our doors. Do they, what do the dogs do? They watch? Or they just walk out? Yeah. No, I, I mean, care. it's mom and dad. They, we've been doing that since they were born. So they're used to the sound. They'll, they'll sleep through it. You'll hear some. <laughs> We were yeah. Bentley snoring. Yeah. Yeah. You know, every <laughs> every once you if it's <laughs> every now and then you get a little like tongue yeah. It, foot, well, no, it depends. Like, oh, that, was a, that was an interesting move. <laughs> it, it depends if it's uh you know if it's early sex like you know Katrina and I are feeling frisky like early on in the evening the boys aren't like wore out and tired like yeah then they're like putting their feet up on the bed and they're wanting to get involved because they think we're playing you know. <laughs> but oh, if it's wrestle time, but if it's yeah. like ten o'clock eleven o'clock sex I mean they're already sleeping they're like they're they're over it they're not into it but I do like. After sex, the first thing I always do is I do I take a I make sure that her panties I'll I'll pick them up and throw them in the 
the uh, dirty laundry because yeah. if I leave That's them prime on real estate, yes, if I leave them on the floor, Bentley will consume them for sure. That's hilarious. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and then like a week later, it uh, seems like it's a week. Maybe it's a couple days. I don't remember the time frame that it takes for the dog to digest. Yeah, I gotta look into out. like locking uh, the laundry basket somehow, or I don't know. I gotta figure. We're this gonna out. go to Justin's house, yeah. and everyone's just gonna be in flip flops, no socks. <laughs> we, yeah, we're running out. It's like you already lose pairs of socks to begin with in the laundry, you know. <laughs> yeah, and it's yeah. like, and he eats them. It's like I'm fucked. <laughs> by MAPS Anabolic. If you're looking to maximize your overall muscle and strength, MAPS Anabolic is the perfect place to start. With a full 30-day money-back guarantee, there is absolutely zero risk. So what are you waiting for? Go to mindpromedia.com and get started today. It's the motherfucking quad. The eagle has landed. First question is from Phoebe's Cray K. What are the differences between barbell and dumbbell exercises? I could feel my chest during a d- dumbbell chest press, but find it hard isolating or focusing on my chest using a barbell. Mm. Mm. There's a reason for that. Yeah. yeah. The Well, let's, we can talk specifically about that exercise. So when you're doing a, a barbell, let's say a bench press, because your hands are fixed on the barbell, you're not able to bring them closer together at the top of a mo- at the top of the movement. And so you're, the range of motion is a little bit limited by the barbell uh, because the pecs bring the upper arm across the body. And so if the hands are stuck in a position, they're only going to go so far. Mm -hmm. So with the chest, you're going to get more of that. The other thing too is part of the stabilization that's involved in a dumbbell chest press means stabilizing the dumbbells enough so they don't fall off to the sides. Mm -hmm. So you're getting some of that inward tension Mm -hmm. of the pecs. So you're going to feel the chest um, a little bit more. But but the question go, you know, then the question remains, does that mean it's a more effective muscle building exercise. Oh, it can be. Well, it can be for somebody who doesn't who doesn't know how. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, you, you could look at it like a like a backloaded squat or a squat with dumbbells or not I guess not with dumbbells or like maybe like a split squat. Uh in terms of like I could feel more of my glute activity uh like say in a Bulgarian squat versus like a backloaded squat, but in terms of like me loading my entire kinetic chain or like making it more of a a compound lift, uh there's a lot more benefits to that in terms of like uh, building well, strength you guys are also missing a, a, a point that i think is a, a major reason for this and it's the the lack of of scapula control hmm. so this is also similar to like why uh, some people have a really hard time when they do a pull-up like filling it in their back because they can't control and retract their scapula to where they can peel back and then feel it in their lats the same thing goes for like a you know, a barbell chest press, somebody lifts that up and right away when you're in a kind of a locked fixed position before you drop the the, the barbell down, you kind of, you, you tense up and you are in a forward position. And a lot of people will start to drop it down right. and they're already in this kind of protracted mm-hmm. or even neutral. Forward shoulder position. Yeah, a forward shoulder type position. And so they drop down the barbell and they end up feeling it all in their shoulders and their arms and they don't feel a lot in their chest. And that's because right. they, they have a hard time pulling the scapula well, There's a propensity back. to not go through like that full range of motion. Yeah, with a barbell for sure. Like, and, and you see that a lot. And with the dumbbells, dumbbells lends itself really well. I actually like to teach, when I would teach a lot of clients, I actually would teach the dumbbell press before I taught a barbell press for this exact reason. Because I could take a client, I could put them on like a stability ball too. I used to love to do that because it's kind of rounded and it kind of naturally drops their shoulders down. And so as they drop the dumbbells down, they have this, it, it, when you drop the dumbbells down by your, like into your, almost like your, you know, your armpits, you, you kind of naturally peel the shoulder blades back and because it's it's very comfortable for you to do that with dumbbells. It's tough to do that with a barbell. And so clients have a hard time feeling in their chest. Yeah. So that's the reason why. And so that that's what I mean by that. It could be more, it could be more effective for somebody who can't do a barbell press correctly, mm-hmm. but both of them done correctly, the the barbell press wins. Joe, uh, Joe DeFranco has a really good cue for this. He says, rather than trying to push the bar away from your chest, imagine you're pushing your body away from the bar. And that makes a lot of sense. Like if you have the bar down Mm. at your chest Mm -hmm. and and you're imagining that you're pushing your body away from the bar, you're probably more likely to have that good chest out, shoulders back position than if you're trying to get the bar away from your body. But you know, this this brings up a great discussion because 
the l- lack of stability does contribute to, in my opinion, and I think a lot of people would agree, does contribute a lot to muscle activation. Mm-hmm. But then you get diminishing returns. Like if we take that to its ultimate conclusion and I have someone with crazy, you know, balancing on something while they're pressing a one dumbbell and, you know, are they going to build as much muscle strength as if they're on a stable bench with a barbell? Yeah, no, no way. They're well, not going to. It's a it's a question of which one generates more force and, and like how uh, you're challenging that mm-hmm. uh, in the entire you know system in the body. Uh, so it's it's more of the movement again versus the muscle where that's that's a movement that I want to get strong in and 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 be able to generate a lot of force uh, completing versus like uh, stabilizing, which will help to uh, help to kind of isolate like a lot of muscles, but also the technique of it and, mm-hmm. you know, really supporting the shoulders. There's a right. lot more benefits to that. Right. You, you want to, there's a, there's a, there's a learning curve that happens with the body with an exercise where you, where you're learning to do the exercise. Once you get past that, that, that learning curve, <laughs> then it becomes, you're able to generate a lot of force in that exercise. Now there's benefits to both, right? Learning how to do an exercise, you get a lot of central nervous system adaptation. You get stronger very quickly. Like if I take someone who's never bench pressed before, they're going to increase their bench very rapidly early on, but it's not really uh, muscle that they're building right out, right out the gates. A lot of it has to do with the skill and the balance and the stability that they're gaining. Once they gain that though, then we can push maximum force and now we're really stimulating uh, muscle growth. And so the problem with dumbbells tends to be, and not that there's a problem with dumbbells uh, you know, per se, but the issue with dumbbells in this, in this particular discussion is when you have a, somebody using dumbbells, if they don't have good control of the dumbbells, they're not able to generate as much force. They're not able to push as much weight as, as if when they use a barbell. And so that many times translates into less muscle activation, maybe not as much of strength gains, maybe not as much of muscle gains. If I had to compare, and I hate saying this because I would never do this because the real, the, the correct answer is to use both. But if I had to compare a dumbbells to barbells and the competition was, which one's going to build the most muscle, the most strength and overall power, I think a barbell would win. But the reality is you want to use both. Um, cause dumbbells, they have another thing too. They, the range of motion is just greater. If you were to look at the total range of motion that you're able to do with the dumbbell in a press versus a barbell, you can go lower with a dumbbell because the bar doesn't hit your chest. And the range of motion of not just coming up, but then coming together, which also incorporates the pecs. So it's just a longer range of motion when it comes to dumbbells. In, in my experience, for, as, for when it comes to muscle building, I like barbells. Once I get someone to the point where they can use a barbell, I like barbells. And then as they become more advanced then I really start to throw the dumbbells in and I start to see. Oh, see, that's interesting. See, I like to reverse. Yeah. I like to start people <clears throat> with dumbbells because of the, and you talk about the the major CNS uh, adaptation at the beginning and then like, and then I'm thinking of also the, just the stabilization and, and joint integrity and being able to get them to learn to stabilize something. I'll use a really light weight and teach them how to, to bench, to overhead press, to do all these movements. And then I will normally move to a barbell because I think a barbell, there's less room for air. With a barbell, you you have to have really good mechanics or there's or or there's a major breakdown somewhere and then you end up compensating with your body to leverage it up or over your head or whatever exercise you're doing. And so just like I, I also start somebody with a body weight squat with dumbbells next to their side. If I've got somebody who's really regressed, a brand new client, I don't throw a barbell on their back first. I first see if they can even hold on to a pair of 10, tens or 20 pound dumbbells and do a body weight, basically squat with some weight next to them and, and perform that with good mechanics and then teach well, them. Well, I think to we're throw. talking about two types of beginners. There's the average client beginner, in which case I would agree with you. I'm talking about the... Like guy that comes in, wants to build muscle, hasn't really lifted weights, you know, teenage, early 20s uh, type of dude. Then I'm going to try. Here's the other problem with the barbell. It's 45 pounds. It's as light as you can go. Uh, believe it or not, there's a lot of beginners, like yeah, average people. Can't yeah. barbell press. That can't, yeah, that can't, that's lift, a barrier right there. can't lift a barbell. In that case, I typically will start with a push-up before I move to dumbbells and barbell. And the push-up is elevated, right? I'll have them use a bar on a Smith machine or something, which is really the only use of a Smith machine. And I'll have them do a push-up on that elevated, get them good at push-ups. Then I move them to dumbbell and a barbell. But if I'm trying to build muscle on some 20-year-old kid, 
Uh, I, I like to get them good at the barbell shit before I start yeah. throwing the dumbbells it's out. It's an there. interesting argument because um, do you want them to have more control initially? So like a barbell provides that uh, bilateral control where you know you can evenly disperse a lot of the uh, pressure and force that you're, you're output or do you want to just isolate and work on the stability of it to then bolster them to get into the barbell mm, That's my theory. Yeah. That's so there's an argument for both for sure. I, yeah, yeah, I don't think I, I think if somebody I think if somebody is not feeling it very much in their chest, this is a perfect example of why I like to use the dumbbells. First, you feel it great in the dumbbells, but you don't feel it very good in the barbell. That to me right away is a, I already know what you're doing. I don't have yeah. to see you. I know if you, if yeah, you're I would doing, assess it off their mechanics is what they're for bringing sure. into me. Like for that sure. would be my. I, you don't even need to see this person move. And if you can tell me that you're feeling it really well in with the dumbbells and you're not feeling it very well with the barbell, I can almost guarantee that you probably are pressing on the bench press with a flat back and your shoulders are, are either forward or in a neutral position and you're not peeling them all the way back. Now, here's a good question. Do you think that the traditional way of doing a, a chest workout, where if you're looking at like a basic muscle building chest workout, typically they start with barbell and then they move to dumbbell and then they move to isolation, right? But they'll start with, it's usually barbell press to a dumbbell press to a fly. Do you think that that's like traditional advice because there's some wisdom behind it? Or do you think that that's just, that's how they did it? Now that's how we always do it. And it really well, doesn't. I, I think because I, mean, I think it could be traded, but more often than not, it's barbell starting first. Correct. Which I think for your your point that you made that I agree with is that it's a superior movement for building muscle, for sure, which I don't think any of us disagree on that, right? If we all agree that a barbell chest press is superior to a dumbbell chest press for building chest, right? Yeah. So that we all agree on. So it makes sense to start a program when writing a program with a barbell press first because you're you're taking into consideration that this person can perform the movement correctly. Mm -hmm. But in reality, many, many people that I have trained – don't I mean and I I can from firsthand I was terrible at benching I I used to I've told the story before on this podcast that one friend would spot the bar the other friend is pinning my shoulders back and I don't understand anything about biomechanics at this point in my life right this is early on mm -hmm. so I don't know what the fuck I'm doing and I, I don't have anybody who's coaching me correctly but I definitely can't feel you know the barbell press in my chest whatsoever because I'm not I'm not firing felt it. it all in your triceps totally yeah. triceps and shoulders I wasn't feeling it in my chest at all and so it, it's very common that I get somebody that I, I do like to teach the dumbbells, but you know, the last thing you want to do is because you don't feel it in the chest, you just ignore it and you're oh, I'm going to stick with dumbbell chest press because I can't feel it that well in my barbell press. No, that's a great, it's telling you something. It's telling you that there's, there's a breakdown somewhere mechanically that, cause it's a chest exercise. There's no way around it. You know what I'm saying? For sure. But like every other extra, any exercise, the secondary muscles can take over the movement if you don't have proper mechanics. And so this person could be dealing with that more likely than not. Again, I think they, they're probably pre chest pressing with a flatter back or their shoulders in a neutral to a protracted forward position when they're pressing. Next question is from Via Nathaniel. What are the recommended macros for muscle building? So macros being your proteins, fats, and carbs, you know, Aside from eating a macro profile that's going to make you feel the best for your health, because that's important, right? So if, if you eat in a way that's not making you healthy, I don't care what macro breakdown you're eating. If you're, so if you're very, very sensitive to carbohydrates, for example, and they give you gastro distress or you, you get gut issues as a result, then a, a diet with carbohydrates, even though what I'm about to say you know, will tell you that carbs will help you build muscle – for that person, it's not going to work. You would go low carbohydrate, okay? So aside from all that, you're healthy and you can eat whatever macro breakdown you want. It's pretty well established that well, with protein, you're going to want to eat a decent amount of protein. And when we say high protein, we're, we're talking about roughly- One to one is about high. Maybe a little less than one gram of protein per pound of body weight uh, in lean individuals. It's important I say that because if you're an obese person, you weigh 350 pounds- don't go eating 350 grams of protein. If you're a relatively lean person, you're not super overweight, take your body weight and right around, that's about as many grams as you want to aim for in protein per day. We know that that is the upper limit for 
the muscle building effects you'll get from protein. Any more than that, and you're not going to get any more benefit. Less than that, you might not get as much of a muscle building benefit. Aside from that, um, you want to have carbohydrates in your diet. They do help build muscle, partially because they help uh, fuel performance. You will notice, again, if you're healthy either way, you will notice that going low carb, you will not be as strong. Even if your calories are high, you're just not going to be able to lift as much weight. The other thing is your, your the pumps that you get in the gym aren't as pronounced as they are when you have some carbohydrates. And there is some evidence that shows that the pump is an important part of the muscle building signaling by itself, aside from the fact that the environment that you create that gives you better pump contributes to the fact that it may build muscle. The pump itself also helps you uh, build muscle. And so, you look awesome. And you look awesome. So I, it's a it's kind of a balanced uh, macro breakdown, if you ask me. Not too low in anything and high in protein. Right. I like a personally, and this is there's. I think there's a lot of room to to go up and down a little bit with your your fats and your carbs, like to the points that you're making. Sal, I think I, I start with my protein and say, okay, I need to have about one to one to keep it easy. You're right, you don't need quite that, but it's it's pretty easy. It's so easy to cut. Yeah, yeah it's, it's easy, easy for me just to say, okay, I weigh 200 pounds. I need 200 grams of protein, right? So that's a very simple breakdown. And then then I like to. I, I like to evenly split it between my fat and my carbs, and I like to kind of rotate back and forth. And you can go up or down five to fifteen percent either direction. Now you're splitting the calories. Yeah, it's important to say that because people will be like, "Oh, cool, even split 100 grams of protein." Oh, I'm sorry, 100 grams of carbs. Oh, good thing of you fat. said that. Yeah, very good. Point. That's not the same. Yeah, yeah, no, that's yeah. a good point. Yeah, so I take the the remainder of my calories that I need, and it's a pretty even split between carbs and fat. And I think that you can have a little more fat or a little less and a little more carbs or a little less based off of what you find works well with you. I don't highly recommend a you know, ketogenic type of diet for somebody like this. I don't think that that's a good idea or even a low-carb diet. I think it's ideal that you're, you're getting adequate carbohydrates, which could mean for you somewhere between 20 and, and, and 60%. It could be anywhere in that range, really. I mean, yeah, 20- wouldn't you base, like, most of your performance in your gym, too, you'd have to base, like, your carbohydrate balance. Like, okay, if I, you know, assess today about how much energy I had to get through <clears throat> these kind of grueling workouts I was doing or whatever that sort of intensity is based off of, like, what you have scheduled out, uh, you know, trying to kind of match uh, what 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 what's the best blend for you in terms of like energy? Yeah, so I I would know like if I'm heading into so if I'm running like a routine like split where I'm splitting my body parts up and I know I'm getting ready to go into a big leg day tomorrow. I mean, I'm I'm definitely getting good amount of carbs the day before and the day of going into that because I know I I, mm-hmm. I want that that fuel source because I'm going to push a big muscle group like my legs or my back. But then let's say it's arms and I'm doing buys and tries. Like I could totally get away with pulling back on the carbohydrates and maybe increase fat. Or let's say it's a day off. I'm not actually training at all. So I don't need that quick fuel. I don't mm-hmm. need that quick fuel to fuel me through the, to power through this workout. So that day I might run a much higher percentage of fat, be satiated. So I'm not chomping and grazing on all kinds of foods. So I'm satiated throughout the day and I feel good. And I don't need this readily fuel all the time because I'm not pushing through a workout. I like that. I like, I like taking carbs and matching it more towards my energy because mm-hmm. for, well, a couple different reasons. One is there's there's some evidence that shows that you become more sensitive to carbs when you do it that way. Now, why do you want to be sensitive to carbohydrates? Well, you want to use them. First off, you don't want to be insensitive to carbs. You don't want to have uh, insulin levels that have to rise more to be able to utilize the carbohydrates because over over a period of time, that can cause uh, you know poor health. You want, you want to be able to use the carbohydrates, uh, utilize them efficiently and effectively. I would like to get a good feeling off of 200 grams of carbohydrates. I don't want to have to eat 400 or 500 grams of carbs to get that feeling. And so going low carb when you're inactive, typically for me, it feels like I get more out of the carbs when I eat them when I need them. And you reintroduce them, yeah. Yeah, so it's like some, like days that were inactive, just like you were saying, Adam, I'm going to eat less carbohydrates. Days that I'm active, before my activity, I'll have more carbohydrates, and that day I'll have more carbs, and I just it just gives me a much better performance. I love to carb cycle. Uh, of all the diet, and I've done most everything. I've ran almost every kind of a diet for the most part, from backloading to front loading carbohydrates to carb cycling to an even split to a ketogenic diet to vegan type shit. Like, I mean, you name it, I've ran 
the diet. And I have, for training purposes and building muscle, the best I have ever felt is doing a carb cycle. Now, when I say that, the problem is I get a lot of people that then message me and they're like, oh, well, what, you know, what ratio do you use? And I'm like, well, the difference between me and I think probably with a lot of the articles that you'll, if you just all of a sudden start Google searching carb cycle, they'll give you a bunch of generic numbers of, you know, cycle, you know, 50 grams, 150, yeah. 250, or give you percentages to cycle. And I really don't do it that way. I, I base it off of what we're talking about right now. If I I know I'm like let's say I have two days in a row where I'm I'm going to be off of training just because I'm traveling or maybe I trained really hard that week and I know I'm I'm needed two days in a row off, uh, and then my first day back let's say is arms like man I might run two or three really low days of carbohydrates in a row and then give it a surge mm-hmm. when I go into the the fourth day which is going to be legs or back or chest or a big muscle that I care to have a lot of fuel in so. You know, I, I really kind of play with that based off of my body, but I do like uh, the idea of of carb cycling and what I have felt personally. It feels the best. It does. It, it feels th- the best. And, and the way I like to tell people to do it, because people will be like, okay, when do I have more carbs? Or, you know, how do I time it? The, the way I like to time it is, that, is about one or two meals before my activity. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, if you're going to work out in the morning – then that means lunch and dinner is the day before is where it starts. That's at least where my mind works. Yep. So if I know I'm working out tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. real hard, then I'll have make sure that the lunch and dinner before, which is the day before, will be higher carb. And then I'll have another high carb meal after uh, the workout. And then if I know I'm not going to work out that hard the following day or whatever, then I'm low carb from then on out. And I just, I feel, I feel that, really good with that's it. That's great advice because this, this is exactly how I used to eat when I was, you know, getting ready for shows um, and why I like to train like at two o'clock in the afternoon, because it would allow me to get two big meals in mm-hmm. well before, you know, two hours plus before I'm going in for my lift. And I just, I felt the best and I could control that. And I played with many different, I've gone from as, as minimal as getting about 100 grams of carbs to as crazy as getting four to 600 grams of carbs before that workout and and paid attention to, do I feel lethargic when I go too much? Is Where's the sweet spot for my body? And there's that's the hard thing about giving people answers to a question like this because I know people are seeking for, tell me a grams of, of carbs I need to have or tell me a percentage. Yeah. It's like, you know, there's going to be a, a wide a wide range uh, or a major uh, variance between each individual on how many grams of carbs you feel the best on for your mm-hmm. workout. And I would recommend just playing with that, you know, try cycling through and, and then have a meal or two before, you know, well, but two hours or more before the main lift that you're going into and, you know, try loading with a hundred grams, try loading with 200 grams, try loading with 75 and, and play with that and really start to evaluate your workout and yeah. get a good idea. I, 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 when I talk to people who are trying to put on mass, uh, especially skinny uh, hard gainers, the classic hard gainers, kind of like you know how I felt I was, and I know Adams talked about himself being one as well growing up. For carbs, you know, we say one gram of protein per pound of body weight. For carbs, it's two and a half to three grams per pound of, uh, of body weight is where you'll see people will start to aim. So if you're a 130 pound kid and you're trying to pack on muscle and you're a hard gainer, you're probably around 300, 350 grams of carbs is what you're going to be looking at. Next question is from Weldertron. When incapable of completing a specified rep range in a program, is it better to cut the reps, cut the weight, or perform a cluster set? Okay, so this is a good question because I've actually gotten this. uh, It sounds like a a transformer. I was going to say that. I knew you were going to say that. So this is a good question because I'll have people ask me about the mass programs. They'll say, well, I can't do this rep range with this weight. Do I just go lower in reps or do I go lower in weight. So here's the thing. The amount of weight that you're lifting is arbitrary. I mean, not entirely, but it kind of is. The weight that you pick is to help you hit the desired rep range right. with the with a high intensity, okay, with a high amount of intensity. So if your programming is calling for 10 repetitions, then you pick a weight. Mm-hmm. I don't care what that weight is. You pick a weight that allows you to pour, perform 10 reps with a high intensity. The only time weight isn't arbitrary is when you're one of these competitive lifters and you have to lift a percentage of whatever right. weight. Or, and you'll, mm-hmm. But even then, they look at rep ranges as well. Like If you're trying to follow our program and you're in a phase two, for example, of MAPS Anabolic, and you're aiming for 12 reps and you went for it and you did six reps. It's too that heavy. That, yeah, that's it. That's all. 
Yeah, like, it's too like, heavy. Lower, don't ch- change the weight, not the reps. Right. Because the programming is calling for a specific amount of reps. That's I, where you're getting the programming. Yeah. I did a YouTube video on this um, a few months ago. So maybe Jackie can attach it to this because I think it's a question that we do get a lot. And I forget that, you know, for somebody who may not know this, it's a, it's a tough thing. Like, how do I know how to choose my weight then for a rep range? And what does it mean to be, you know, eight, what do you guys mean by eight to 10 rep range? Then I thought I got a lot of good feedback from that video that I think I explained to people, you know, how you choose that weight. I mean, the reason why there's a, a rep range is because it's it's really tough to just I, I can't walk. I can get close because I've been doing this for so long, but I mean, if I were to go out right now and say hey, I'm going to dumbbell press eight to ten reps, like you know, I have a kind of an idea about how much weight that's going to be, but I don't know for sure how, based off how I feel and how sore I am from everything else. So, you know, I'll I'll grab a weight that I think is going to be fit that. And then that really tells me where I need to be after that first set. I do that first set and I go heavier, oh, lighter. Yeah. yeah. Right. If I, if I, if I do, and if it tells me 10 to 12 and I grab a weight and I easily do 12, I know I'm going to increase on the next set. If I barely get to 10, then I know I might even have to go lighter on the next one because I probably am going to be a little. Isn't that interesting? It, after all the experience we have, you know, with that, like it still changes. Like, yeah. like I'll go in and approach like an overhead press for for example, and if I did a lot of the prep and prime work ahead of time, like totally different result. You know, I could I could lift and perform sometimes, you know, more as a result of that. But there's some days where you know, just the accumulation of stress, life stress, work stress, all this other stuff really factors into that same exact lift to where now I have to adjust the load that day specifically because of how my body feels. Here's here's what's important about how much weight you're lifting because it's one of the metrics you can use to measure your progress. That's it. Yeah. Other than that, you really shouldn't give a shit what, how much, I used to get caught up on this all yeah. the time. Just don't get fixated. On I that. used to get caught up all the time. I'm going to go in and I had this, this number in my head. I'm going to lift you know, this much weight uh, in my shoulder press. And I pick it up and I could only do four reps. Fuck it. That's the weight that I'm going to lift. So now I'm just doing four reps. That's wrong. You want to go in there. You want to aim for a rep range. You want to aim for a type of intensity and you want to aim for a a certain type of form. You want to go in and practice these exercises with a certain type of intensity. Whatever weight fits within that paradigm is the weight that you're going to use. Don't get stuck on the weights because this gets people in trouble all the time. Like, I'll see guys lifting weights and their form looks good when they're squatting with the 35s on each side. But nope, they got to have a big wheel on each side. So let me put a 45. Now their form is not good. Is that doing them any good that they just went heavier because it looks better? Of course not. So the weight is pretty much arbitrary. I, I, I almost wish that, you know, there was like some kind of, you know, technological advancement where all weights look the same and it would just dial in the perfect amount of weight for you, then we wouldn't get stuck so much on, you know, <laughs> how, what the weights look like <laughs> yeah, and yeah, ego yeah, and all that shit. Yeah. Just, just, just follow the programming. It's the reps that matter. You'll notice in our programming, we never tell you weight to lift. First of all, it'd be impossible because everybody's so different. Just buy a bunch of CrossFit but, weights. Yeah, I, I but I don't care how much weight you're lifting. What I care about is here's your rep range, here's how much rest you're doing between sets, here's your tempo, um, and then, of course... Here's your form. And it's it's expected that you're going to have to probably lighten the load up quite a bit. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's it's a very humbling part of the program. Those that follow the program to a T, every time you move to a new phase, it's humbling. Yeah. You know, when you go when you go from one to two, it's like, oh man. Oh dude, how humbling is it to do twenty rep squats? Yeah. <sighs> <laughs> right, it's super it humbling. Every time. All of a sudden, you're you're it's fifty percent or less the weight. That's a big difference, you know. So all of a sudden, you go for feeling like a tough guy who's squatting four plates, and now you're one plate just to get twenty reps out. Like, <laughs> yeah. but you're better off doing that than going like, oh, I can't stand to only have one plate on there, so I'm going to put two plates on there, and I'm only going to do ten. Like, no, if it's calling for twenty reps, you're going to get more bang for your buck to do twenty reps at a much lighter weight than to do ten just to just to save your ego. Mm-hmm. Next up is CMOS23. What's the fitness trend and or supplement that will be the new thing 10 years from now? And what will be a thing of the past? 10 so, years? I, well, I'm going to just say in the shit. future because 10 years is too hard. Yeah, right? 10 Here years goes the Nostradamus predictions. Yeah, I, I'll, 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 first off, I wish I knew what the supplement, what the next big supplement would be because then I'd be the guy making it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we'd, be, we'd be rich. But as far as fitness trends are concerned, I'll tell you what I think. I think... 
the next big mainstream, and it may not feel this way to us in the space because to us it always feels this way, but I think the next mainstream thing to, uh, that's going to go big is heavy weight training. I really do. I think the time is right for people to really get into lifting weights and lifting heavy weights. I'm seeing more and more women on Instagram do bulking, you know, oh, I'm on a bulk, I'm lifting heavy, I'm building muscle. I'm like, God, you never saw that. You never saw women talk about that shit. And these are like, these are bikini models that are talking about it. These are girls that are in college that are talking about it who normally would be like, oh, I'm just doing tons of cardio. I think that's the next big thing. I really think you're going to see a lot more people talk about and want to get stronger uh, with weights. I can get on board with that. And not mm. only because I that would be cool. Right away, when I couldn't think of a new thing, but I could tell you what I think is going to be a thing of the past in 10 years. I think these. Um, F45 orange and I mean I know I'm going to ruffle a bunch of fucking feathers again on this <laughs> but you know cuz I've been saying that group classes should die but whatever I, I I do believe that I think more and more people that start to look into the the group model of lifting weights uh, first of all I believe that well over 50% if not 80% I would say that are taking these classes that are group you know lifting weight classes none of them are really actually even doing proper lifting weights. And so if, if your theory is right, mm -hmm. Sal, that we're going to go to this lifting heavy, strong, and strength building type of routines is going to be a thing in the future, then the the natural thing to die would be these classes that mm -hmm. encourage a cardio version of mm -hmm. weights. Because when you go by an F45 class, an Orange Theory class, or any of these, and I know I'm picking on those two because the first two that popped in my head, but there's a fucking bajillion of them now. And they're all, it's like, it reminds me back when we had, when we ran gyms and we had the body pump classes, that's what it was called back then. And it was a, a regular old group X instructor that taught it. And she used to get the plastic weights out and they're doing, you know, uh, jazzercise type exercise with terrible form. five times. Yeah. yeah. It, well, it's, it's like one step better than that is, is really what we've done. They've got a little bit heavier weights, but it's still the same concept of this circuit mentality. It's not much different than curves was. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and I, but I think that people are starting to figure out how important, like, you know, weight training is. And I think the, the small box uh, companies were smart and they saw that and they said, okay, here's a way to make people feel good and encourage them to do it and feel secure about it by putting them in a group where there's a lot of people that are learning how to do it together. And so that's kind of where we're at right now. And if your theory is right, Sal, then I believe that this is going to die in 10 years mm -hmm. because those same people that were kind of insecure and scared to go try lifting at a, you know, at a gym or a, a major, a major box or kind of intimidated to do that are going to be less intimidated to do it because they're going to find out that it's far better for them to to create an individual program for themselves and do a more strength-based program and get some rest well, in between sets. My thoughts, and I, of course, this is completely my own hope and my own bias of where I see uh, the most substantial efforts uh, changing uh, the culture and changing everything and leading into that direction of uh, weight training, which I brought up a while ago, was to get back into the actual physical education of, like, let's structure these recesses. Let's structure more active play that uh, is challenging in terms of climbing, in terms of obstacles, these things that are literally built in schools to where, you know, we can get kids, we, we don't have to necessarily, like, force kids off their phone, force them off the electronics. Like we just provide this, this experience for them so that they actually challenge and engage their muscles and they learn about their body. Uh, you know, and we, we, we build that as a foundation, uh, early. So that way they, they move in and they, they actually have, uh, some sort of like, a, uh, an established foundation there to work with. You're, you're going to, I agree. I think you'll see more of that, Justin, just because I think the, the, the need is higher. You know what I mean? There's more. Of Everybody a cares about kids more. I, I hate to say it more than adults. Like, yeah. Like the emphasis, like we're going to see studies come out that, like our kids are being like are, are fucked up, yeah, because and, of what we, the way that we've been handling the education. Yeah, and kids are weaker uh, than they've ever been. They they done tests on this. Who there's, shared there's, the Who shared the article? Was it Jackie who shared the article, or someone? Oh no, it was Lewis Howells posted, and I believe I tagged one of you two on it. He just posted this. Look at Lewis Howells' Instagram. I thought this was pretty cool, and I believe it was a a principal in uh, in China 
learn oh, how he's to doing this like dance with the kids. Yeah, learn yeah. like a you know like a one of the popular. Or yeah, it's it's a popular dance right now, and uh-huh. and he does it with the entire school. And I think that was that's really cool. Yeah. What a what yeah. a cool thing to do with all the kids to encourage them to move. I think you'll see more of that. So here's here's another reason why I think weight training is going to be the next mainstream fitness thing. Um. This has been known for a long time. Women make up uh, a majority of the consumers. They actually drive the market far more than men do. In fact, they buy more of the men male products than men do. And part of the reasons they buy, they go they're the ones that do the shopping and picking things out for the husbands. But all of the things women make up a large percentage. And guys have been lifting weights for a long time. What you're seeing now more than ever. Is women are lifting weights, yeah, and in, in ways that you're supposed to lift weights, yeah, yeah, no, and and so I think we're about to see a huge wave of women who are like, oh, I lift weights. Like, this is important. It's not like cardio. It's yeah. actually lifting and I, getting stronger. I can. I, that's yeah, why I, I can yeah, get on board sure. with that. That's why I think it, the group thing is going to change, man. Yeah. It really is because right. That's it's a good step in the right direction. I really. I and who are the largest? Who are the who are the, the largest attendees of group classes? Right, women. Yep. And I think they're going to start moving in the direction. Yeah. And well, what, what's okay? So what's the nutrition trend you you predict? Oh, I for I think ancestral type stuff is going to keep growing. Um, yes. I think with diet or with supplements, I should say, and diet, it's going to go more and more natural, well sourced. I mean, people are wealthier now. People have the money. Mm. Uh, and the time to spend on getting better I, products. I think I think we're we're gonna try and really tie in with that genome with the twenty three and Me with all this stuff like really to like they're they're gonna try to to present you with products that are gonna best suit you and be catered to you in terms of uh, what you know. Uh, based off your genetics, what's going to be best for you? Oh, that's mm-hmm. a good prediction. That's I, interesting. I, that's a very good prediction. I totally agree with that. And it's going to be a bunch of bullshit, is what it is. Exactly. <laughs> it's still going to be shenanigans. And then what Sal said, I, you know, I think that's already happened. Like I think, you know, I mean, look at paleo is the, you know, is the big thing right now. Like everyone's already talking about that. Whole thirty is probably one of the most uh, sold and followed diets out there right now. So we're already moving in that direction of of uh, away from processed. Foods well, it was that, it wasn't that long ago. You go. To a major grocery store and they didn't even have an organic yeah, section. No, yeah. Now all grocery stores, I think the, the largest, you know who the largest seller of organic foods is? Hmm. Walmart. Walmart, yeah, I remember. Yeah. Walmart remember sells that. more organic food than anybody, believe it or not, because yeah. um, yeah, they're so large. So I think it's going to keep moving in that direction where you're going to see more people wanting well-sourced foods. Companies like ButcherBox, who you know we, we, we talked about them earlier in this episode. The, companies like that, you're going to see more and more of those where people are not just trying to buy meat from some random place. They don't know where it came from or what the food you know, itself ate. No more random meat. That people are going to want to know what did this what did this food eat itself? Where right. is it from? Yeah. You know, what's the quality? I think that I think the um, I agree. I think you're going to see more transparency. I wouldn't be surprised if we see companies in the near future where I'll be able to go online and look at the dairy. I'll be able to go on there and look at the cows right now as they're producing the milk that I just bought. Well, I'll, I'll be able to check myself. <laughs> well, remember yeah, totally. when we when we first started the podcast, we we're only about a year in. One of the first we had somebody approach us that wanted to do. Uh, we talked about doing a, a pure way, like nothing in it, nothing, no flavors, protein, yeah. protein and. Part of the pitch that he had on us was that we would take us to the dairy, we would see where everything started, and that they wanted to market it that way too. So I agree. I think that's, I think transparency. I think people are wanting more and more to know where where their food is being sourced from, exactly. What I mean, think of eating. that. Think of that. It, where imagine you buy your 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 meat and you can tap in with your app for whatever company, yeah. look at the meat, the the cows grazing you can watch the food yourself see for yourself talk about the transparency <laughs> Charlie, that i want butcher box to tell you my cow i want to know yeah. my cow's name and i want to see him every thursday to see how he's doing you have a little slaughter right. day party well, uh, i don't think i don't think far. they'll ever show the slaughter <laughs> far. i think that'll reduce sales yeah, yeah, yeah. i don't think so <laughs> all right so uh, i want to remind everybody that i think what we have one day left doug is it the final day for maps anabolic 50 percent off final five so Final hours, so it ends tonight. Ooh. You don't have uh, much time. Go Get to on your computer. MapsFitnessProducts.com. Use the code RED50, R-E-D, 50 for 50% off. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at MindPumpMedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes Maps Anabolic, 
MAPS performance, and MAPS aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.